Everybody be seated, please. You may proceed, Ms. Captain. Thank you, Your Honor. Let's talk about the phone evidence. I know you guys enjoyed Corbett 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So I want to take a few minutes to review the evidence that we learned from the phones. It's dry stuff, but it's super important stuff to this case. On, uh, I want to talk about the June trip first. So on June 2nd, the first trip car was rented by Garcia. At that time, Ms. McDaniel's phone records are consistent with her leaving her residence in North Bay Village. Oh, this clicker is amazing. <laughs> All right, it's new clicker. Clicker gate is concluded. All right, so uh, at the time that this first car was rented for the first trip by Mr. Garcia, Catherine Nibana says, I never went to the rental place, which was Comfort Rental Car, but her phone records are consistent with her leaving her residence at North Bay Village, going to Comfort Rental Car, remaining there during the time that the rental was occurring, and then returning back to her residence. When she's at the rental car place, she gets a call from Charlie Adelson, and then on her trip back from the rental car place, she talks to Charlie Adelson for 25 minutes. It should be noted that Mr. Rivera is nowhere around, he's on the other side of town when this car was rented. Um, we know from the rental records that Garcia <coughs> trades that car out at some point, possibly because he got the ticket in the first one. And then we know that they used that second car after he made the trade out, the Sonata, to do the June trip to Tallahassee. Rivera's phone shows us an idea of the route they traveled along on their first trip to Tallahassee on June 5th, 2014. We, you don't see orange dots on here because we don't have any location information because the provider wasn't able to give us any location information for June at all for Mr. Garcia. So it doesn't mean he wasn't there. There's just no phone location information for him at all for this time period. Um, but we do know that he rented the car for the trip. The trip, the, the car that he rented did get the ticket. Well, the car didn't get the ticket. Mr. Rivera got the ticket in Gainesville, consistent with these blue dots. And we know that both Rivera and Garcia were seen in Tallahassee on that first trip, according to Louis Rivera and Shadrick Nobles. Remember him? Believe it. All right, so... This is a slide where the GPS on the Comfort rental car uh, pinged the vehicle. So we know the location of that first vehicle, June trip, on June 5, 2014, at 3.17 p.m. It was very pinging very near uh, the Trescott Drive residence of Mr. Markell. So the phone gives us an idea of what they were up to. Um, showing that upon arriving in Tallahassee, they're in the area of the Budget Inn. Okay, then the next morning, they're in the area of Trescott Drive, consistent with scouting out the Markel residence, as Mr. Rivera indicates they did that day. Then Rivera returns to Miami. You can see his phone traveling along the route back to Miami arriving back in the early morning hours of June 6, 2014. So it was a one-night stay in Tallahassee. They drove up. They did the scouting. It didn't work out. They couldn't find him or he wasn't alone or whatever. They couldn't get the job done, and they returned back to Miami. The GPS data on the vehicle is consistent uh, with that. And then... This is going to be a slide which indicates the, uh, what does this indicate? Hyundai GPS return. Okay. So on June 6th, after Garcia and Rivera returned from the first trip to Tallahassee, Catherine McBanawa's phone, where is it? Here, is consistent with going to return the rental car. So she's consistent with going to pick it up and also going to return it. So we have the rental car consistent with being at her residence here on 6 6 of 14 at 8 48 a.m. And then we have her phone consistent with being at the rental car place when the car was returned. Again, Rivera is nowhere near the comfort rental car when that car is returned. Garcia is. 
the Magbanawa is. All right, this slide shows you a summary of all the communications between Magbanawa and Garcia during this first June trip. You know, there was some testimony about them talking during the trip, and this <coughs> gives you an idea of every single communication that occurred between them to make that, to corroborate the possibility that those statements were in fact made. All right, I want to talk about phone events leading up to the July trip. So we're leaving the June trip. We're going to the events prior to the July trip. This slide shows phone activity the night before the Prius rental. So July 14, there's some text communication on the iCloud between Mr. Adelson and Ms. Magbanawa suggesting that they're going to get dinner together that night. And then the phone evidence indicates that Mr. Adelson picked Ms. McBanawa up and they did go out to eat. Following that dinner date, there are multiple communications between McBanawa and Garcia from midnight to 2 a.m. The next morning, July 15th, Mr. Garcia calls Comfort Rental Car, which is the same place that that first car was rented from. So that's significant, just in thinking of what they might have been up to, thinking about running a second vehicle. But ultimately, Comfort is not the uh, rental place that is used for the second trip. They instead go to the hybrid save gas place, which is where Rivera rents the Prius. Um, during the time of the rental, the phones are consistent with both Garcia and Rivera being present for the rental of the Prius. <coughs> And at the time that the Prius is rented, Magbanawa is communicating first with Charlie Adelson and then uh, with Sigfredo Garcia. And there's our rental contract that includes Mr. Rivera's information as well as Mr. Garcia's number listed at the top as brother. All right, so the Prius is rented. They don't leave immediately for Tallahassee. You'll see, what are we seeing? Okay, so this is a slide consistent with the Prius GPS. So the Prius rental company is pinging the vehicle, which they do every 24 or 25 hours to verify where the vehicle is. And that pings at 10.25 p.m. on July 15th. And that's consistent with being at Ms. McBanawa's residence. All right, now, July, uh, we have the July trip. So on this one, we have location information for both Mr. Garcia's phone and Mr. Rivera's phone. So you can see these dots are events where their phones are communicating with towers on the way up to Tallahassee, consistent with them leaving and arriving in Tallahassee at about, what time? One I can't remember. Here's the toll plaza. So when they left Miami, they went through the toll plaza eastbound on Alligator Alley at 2.18 p.m. So I think the ticket was at like 9.30 and then they arrived in Tallahassee around 11.30 or noon. Here's a GPS ping showing the vehicle on the way to Tallahassee. Um, westbound on I-10, and that is at 11.28 p.m. And here's the budget in receipt where <coughs> Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia stayed their first night in Tallahassee on the July trip. Louis Rivera testified that during this July trip, Mr. Garcia was getting some instructions and direction from Ms. Magbanawa. The trip was only about I think about 36 hours from the time they left Miami to the time that they got back to Miami. During this trip, there were 21 phone events between Garcia and Magbanawa, including 12 calls. Um, it should also be noted that on June 5th, so I'm backing you up now to June 5th, while Garcia and Rivera were in Tallahassee, Catherine Magbanwa did try to call that old number that had belonged to Louis Rivera uh, for the first time ever in the records that we examined and wasn't able to get him because he was no longer using that phone. Um, but this is a call pattern consistent with her trying to get up with Garcia, trying to get up with Garcia. And when she can't get him, she calls other people to try to find him. 
And it made sense on June 5th when they were in Tallahassee that she tried to call Rivera or the number she had for Rivera because she knew they were together. So that's all the phone communications between Garcia and Magdalena on the July trip. Um, so I talked about the instructions that Rivera says Ms. McDaniel was giving, such as, quote, don't do anything stupid. Um, on the day before the murder, they did something stupid by shooting a hole in the Prius. They also did something pretty stupid by posting a picture of an owl um, on Instagram because, you know, obviously nobody's supposed to know where you are, and if you're posting on Instagram, it'll be obvious that you're in Tallahassee. Um, this fact is interesting because... It just is something odd that maybe you wouldn't make up if you were falsifying testimony or being spoon-fed testimony. I didn't spoon-feed in the owl. Um, and, you know, we have owls here in Tallahassee, but probably not very much down in Miami where these guys live. So <laughs> Rivera probably thought it was pretty neat and worth posting on Instagram. It's interesting that Ms. Magdana would call, like, you idiots, take this thing down. Um, in addition, Ms. Magdanawa told them on this date, so this is the 17th, that you have to get this done tomorrow because Dan Markell is leaving town. So that's why they knew that the job had to be completed on July 18th, and that's when it did get done. 23 phone communications between Garcia and Magdanawa on the July trip. Now I want to back up just a little bit, talk about the July trip starting with... Uh-oh. Thursday. Okay. So Thursday, July 17th. This is the day before the murder. Luis Rivera says they scouted around the Martel residence. Both phones are consistent with having done that. There are two different time periods on this date before the murder where um, both phones are consistent with being around the Martel residence. And then that evening, they're at the Roadway Inn in the room rented for them by Mr. Nobles. Both phones are consistent with the roadway in that night into the morning hours of July 18th. All right. Friday, July 18th, this is the day that Dan Markell was murdered. The Prius arrives at Premier Gym at 9.16 in the morning. We know that from the surveillance video. And it departs around 10.38 a.m. So they wait there, stalking Mr. Markell after already having followed him to the daycare as testified to by Mr. Leland and also Mr. Rivera, corroboration. Um, and then the bus shows them leaving Premier and heading towards Dan Markell's residence. So with the bus videos being both right before and right after the homicide, you can narrow the time frame of Mr. Markell's death to between 1044 and 1054. We know that Mr. Markell started his phone call with uh, Mr. Schlazer at 10.48, so that narrows it even further. Ten, between 10.48 and 10.54 is when this crime occurred. And as you recall, Mr. Geiger kind of was keeping an eye on the place for a while before he called 911, and that call came in at 11.01. The first phone call that either, so that Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera's phones are consistent with being turned off in the area of Premier Gym, and there's no additional location information between then and when they're back on the interstate headed back towards Miami about 12.30 um, p.m. That's when we get any more, uh, after Premier, that is the first phone information we get. And that is, that piece of phone information is Mr. Garcia calling Ms. Magdanawa. At 12.30 p.m., that call does connect. The conversation does occur. That information corroborates Mr. Rivera's testimony that we called her and told her it was done. She said she knew. And then we told her we wanted our money. She said we'd have it the next day. Um, if you look at all the parties that are involved in this case or that the state is alleging are involved, if you look at their phone activity from midnight before the murder, through the first call after the murder. It's kind of interesting. You can see all the calls. The red line denotes when the murder occurred in this case. So you've got <coughs> Katie to Garcia, Charlie to Katie, you know, you can read. All right, so murder's done. They travel back to Miami and they hit this toll plaza 
eastbound at 5.23 p.m. Then they're seen at the Pembroke Pines ATM where Mr. Rivera does a transaction there. And after the ATM, both phones, Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia, are consistent with being at Rivera's residence at about 7 p.m. that night, the night of the murder. All right, let's talk about this Friday night meet. Where is Catherine Magdanoa once Garcia and Rivera get back to Miami after the murder? Um, between 9.46 p.m. that night and 10.20 p.m. that night of the murder, um, this is kind of the, the red arrow is Miss Magdanoa. Orange is still Mr. Garcia, and blue is still Mr. Rivera. So you can see all consistent with being at Mr. Rivera's residence for a meeting. All right, so Catherine Magbanawa has two events this night with Charlie Adelson while she's in the area of Mr. Rivera's residence, 10, 12, and 10, 20 p.m., after which her phone doesn't have any activity consistent with it being turned off for that night. And then we'll go to Saturday morning. Saturday morning, July 19th, 2014. This is all the call activity for that morning. There's like a flurry of activity for about 40 minutes. Catherine Magbanoa is repeatedly trying to reach Mr. Garcia. She's unsuccessful because he's dumped his phone after the murder. Location of Ms. Magbanoa shows that she's traveling south from the area consistent with Charlie Adelson's um, residence. Of course, it can be consistent with anything north of where she was at that time. Um, south toward uh, Rivera's residence. After seven failed attempts to call Garcia, Catherine Magbanoa finally reaches out to Anthony Ortiz because she wasn't able to reach Rivera on his phone. She calls Ortiz. That's her first communication with Ortiz ever. That's at 9.47 a.m., on the day of the money drop, July 19th. Anthony Ortiz in turn calls Garcia himself, gets no answer because Garcia's dumped his phone. That was at 9.49 a.m. Then Ortiz calls and reaches Luis Rivera at 10.02. So now Luis Rivera knows that Catherine Magbanawa is looking for Garcia. Rivera knows where to find Garcia because he's at Shrimp's house. Then for the first time ever, first time ever, we have phone contact between Rivera at the new number, the, the number he had at the time of the homicide, and Catherine Magbanawa when she calls him at 10.22 a.m. Um, first, she didn't get him. She tried Garcia again, and then one minute later, she does call and get Mr. Rivera. This time, his timing is consistent with when Rivera says he talked to her, and she was irritated because she couldn't locate Garcia. She had the money. When are y'all going to come get this money? So between 10 and 10.30, Rivera's phone is consistent with going to the home of Garcia's new girlfriend, Shrimp. I guess Garcia was living there at the time as well. Rivera says he sent Anthony Ortiz with his, Rivera's phone. Rivera said he didn't go to get Garcia, but in any event, Garcia was fetched from Shrimp's house and there was a meeting at Rivera's place. Um, about 10.23 to 10.32 a.m., there are events which, in which it appears Catherine Magbanoa arrives at Luis Rivera's house, and they all meet up for this money drop. So all their phones are consistent with being there. Have I missed a slide? Yes. Yeah, this is the money drop slide. All right, and what kind of money does she bring? All hundreds stapled together in stacks, consistent with the unusual way that Charlie Adelson packages his money through the bless her heart tooth extracting testimony of June Umchinda, who appears to be back in love with Charlie. We know he staples his money, that's a pretty weird thing, and the money they got paid with the staple. Why does Catherine Magdanawa have to be the connection? Is it you know, 
Is she the only link between the people that wanted this murder done, the people with the motive to do this, and the hitmen that were just doing it for money? Rivera testified that she is the connection. But is there anything else to corroborate that? Do you all not want to rely on Rivera because he's a gangster and he's a murderer and he's, you know, all the things. Um, so what else do we have to corroborate what it is he's telling us about Magbanoa being the link? All right, so starters, she was sleeping with both Charlie Adelson and Sigfredo Garcia. That's a pretty good link. They knew each other existed, but they didn't know that she was playing both sides. Um, law enforcement reviewed all the <coughs> call detail records. So this is important. Law enforcement looked at all call detail records of Magbanoa, Garcia, mm. Rivera, Markel, Donna Adelson, Charlie Adelson, and Harvey Adelson, including Charlie Adelson's iCloud, which was hundreds of thousands of records, and also that RICO wire associated with Mr. Rivera's uh, federal conviction. And there was, in all of that data, zero evidence or proof of communication whatsoever between any Adelson and Mr. Rivera. There was no evidence or proof of communication whatsoever between the Adelsons and Mr. Garcia, except for that one phone call on July 1st from Garcia to Harvey Adelson that was a hangout or a voicemail. And that call it was not answered. I don't, I don't know if it was a hang-up or a voicemail. One call, July 1st, from Garcia to Harvey Adelson, and that's how we managed to identify Garcia on the tower dump because of that connection to Harvey. Other than that, the two killers had zero communication. And the defense wants to say, well, what about all these other phones that we don't know about? Let's focus on what we know about. You know, what we don't know about, we don't know. What is the evidence? Show us. In the case, they're talking to everybody else on these phones. They're, they're doing drug deals on the phones. Charlie does his steroid deals and all that on the phones. Or the I, it's a present on the iCloud. So why would we think there's some... We would have to speculate if we want to try to say there's some other link between the Adelsons and the killers. It just doesn't exist. There's no evidence. What is there evidence of? A link. <coughs> and the link is named Catherine Magbanwa. I mean, it seems obvious. Um, there is no evidence or proof or records at all of Charlie Adelson and Sigfredo Garcia communicating. The defense showed you that deep sea fishing text and purported that to be evidence <coughs> that these two were talking. <coughs> But to the contrary, if you read it in its context, I think you will see that it's evidence to the contrary, that they were not talking. Did he call you? No. Oh, yeah, he did. He wants to take me deep sea fishing. Ha, ha, ha. Even their client on the stand admitted that was a joke and that she's not aware of any contact between Mr. Garcia and Mr. Charlie Adelson. I want to talk a little bit about the financial evidence in this case. All right, let's start with the Adelsons. What did Mary Hull tell us about the Adelsons' financial picture? It was quite different from what Wendy Adelson told us about her parents. She said they were not very well off and they were not millionaires. <coughs> but what their financial records revealed is that they have 18 investment accounts totaling somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 pages worth of investments. Charlie Adelson earns between three and three and a half million dollars annually and separately the Adelson Institute earns another two million annually. That doesn't even include their investments. Here are the checks that Catherine McBanawa got from the Adelson Institute. The red line items indicate that these are consecutively numbered checks. Here is a photograph of the motorcycles that Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera bought. Mr. Garcia bought a car, this Monte Carlo, within one week of getting paid to do this murder. Well, the defense says this is a pretty crappy car. 
Okay, I mean, it's not like they got a million bucks. They blew a bunch of money. They got about $40,000. He bought a car and a motorcycle within a short period of the time from the murder. I would think that would be of importance to y'all. Defense wants to strike that. So he got $40,000. This is Mr. Garcia. He gave a couple thousand out of his cut to Mr. Rivera. So let's say he was down to 38,000. So it's not like he's gonna be able to purchase a luxury vehicle with that. But he did buy this motorcycle on August 22nd, 2014, a gold Maxima on October 17th, 2014, and the uh, Monte Carlo as well, all within three months of the homicide. Mr. Rivera bought the matching bike and also a Camry within two weeks of the murder, within two weeks. <coughs> So between the two of them, within three months of the murder, we've got five vehicles being purchased. Other than that, Mr. Rivera gave a little money to his family and managed to keep his account in the black for a couple months. I think it went back in the red in November, and he started living hand to mouth off his paychecks again, as he was prior to coming up here and extinguishing the life of Dan Markell for that $37,000. Catherine Magvanawa, she deposited her money, she deposits her money, and she de makes deposits in small amounts, sometimes more than one per day at different ATM machines. She's got two different banks, and she's going around to different ATMs depositing money into multiple accounts. Note uh, on one of the exhibits, which I don't think I have in here, <coughs> don't. Um, but it's Exhibit 106. There's a payment to Mr. Zangane on there. Uh, July 21st, 2016, $1,000. Mr. Zangane does not represent her. And September 12th, 2016, $2,000. Ms. Magdanawa says she earned this cash working off the books in a nightclub. She can name no boss no co-workers, no patrons, and produce no documents whatsoever to support this contention. As evidence, she offers a photograph of herself scantily clad at what appears to be a nightclub. I don't see an apron, I don't see a tray, I don't know if she works there, I don't know when that photo was taken, I don't know nothing about nothing based on that. She also offers a check that was deposit or attempted to be deposited from Club Fate. Yindra Mascaro indicated that she quit Club Fate because Club Fate didn't pay, their checks were bouncing. And Mary Hull confirmed that, the check that the defense has proffered into evidence for your consideration, which first of all, it's not cash, it's a check for tips. It bounced, so it cannot go into this consideration of her accounts at all. Yindra Mascaro told you that Catherine Magbanawa was not working in the clubs at the time that this murder occurred. Yinder Mascaro is Ms. Magbanawa's best friend. One of them is the godmother to the other one's child. I think Ms. Magbanawa is godmother to her child. To the contrary, Mascaro says that she and Magbanawa worked together at Hollywood Live in 2014. Mascaro quit the club when she found out she was pregnant on July 4th, 2014, and Magbanawa had already quit four to eight weeks prior to that because she was, quote, tired of the club life and was, quote, over it. So Kate, Catherine Magvanoa quit between May 4th and June 4th, according to this testimony, 2014. It should be noted that June 4th was the first trip to Tallahassee, intended to be the murder trip. So maybe she quit that crappy job because she was anticipating this big payday mm -hmm. that was gonna happen if the murder had occurred as originally planned. Then she goes to work uh, for the Adelsons and collects a paycheck there after the homicide. She did work prior to that for Charlie Adelson's friend, Mr. Jerome Obed, at uh, Broward Dermatology. She worked there for a couple months, and that's indicated on here. Her Sophie Dental Care, the records are indicated on here as well. All of her employment that can be documented is present on this chart. And look where the gap is. I mean, I didn't make this up. 
And that's where the cash spike is. If she's working at the club, unbeknownst to Yendra Mascaro, she had the best month of her whole life, the same month that Mr. Markell was killed. If she made $1,500 a night, she only did it in July of 2014. And that was before the breast augmentation that supposedly increased her tips with a P. Objection. Overruled. <coughs> her breast augmentation was in October of 2014. So to the extent that it was intended to augment her tips, it did not. They, in fact, declined after that time frame. Her cash deposits declined after that time frame. According to Ms. Mascaro, Ms. Magbanoa worked for Jerome Obed, Dr. Obed, at Broward Dermatology for a couple months, and then the next job that her best friend is aware of her having was at Optimar Realty. <coughs> There's the murder. That's when the murder occurred. That's when the breast augmentation occurred. All right, we're going to get to that in just a minute. I want to wrap up the financial stuff. The check Catherine Magbanoa is using, I talked about how it was not cash. I talked about how it bounced, so it cannot explain the cash spike. In addition, according to Ms. Mascaro, you cannot make this kind of money that we're seeing on that chart. So I'll go back to it. In the clubs, even on a good night, we're talking about four or $500. Ms. Magbanoa says no, it's more like $1,500. Even if she was making $1,500. It doesn't account for that spike, and the timeline doesn't add up. Ms. Mascaro says they worked one to two nights a week, each of them, that Ms. McBanella worked one to two nights a week. Even if she made three grand, had a $1,500 night twice in July of 2014. It's only $3,000. She's got 13,000 in deposits. Her being put on the payroll at the Adelson Institute is a sham. There is no evidence of her doing any work on the weekend. She even admits she might have gone up there one time. There is no evidence of her making any calls or doing anything online, and we were listening to her phone. She wasn't able to shed any light on what it is that she does while she was on the witness stand. She said she's the personal assistant to Charlie Adelson, or was the personal assistant. I don't know what that entails, but why would the Adelson Institute be paying her? The Adelson Institute is a separate entity. Mr. Adelson travels from office to office as a freelance periodontist. Why wouldn't he pay his own personal assistant? Why is Donna Adelson writing checks out of the Adelson Institute account for Catherine Magbanawa at a business that does not employ remote employees? does not have work to be done outside the office by phone or by laptop. That, in the history of the office, Ms. Labrada has worked there 40 years. They've never had such an employee. But Magbana was the exception. She's the one that gets put on the payroll. And she's not even dating Mr. Adelson. This isn't like, hey, put my girlfriend, she's down on her luck, put her on the payroll, Mom. He's chucked her already. Around the time of the murder, he ghosted her. And then two months later, she ends up on the payroll. Never in the history of that office have they employed one of his ex-girlfriends. Objection, facts, not evidence. Overruled. And as we know, there were many. You heard what transpired when the officers walked in there to subpoena her employment file. Erica Johnson had to go call Charlie Adelson for direction on what to tell him. And he said, what? I'm going to have to call you. Well, first he went, uh, 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 uh. And then he said, let me call you back on your cell phone from a landline. Said, now, why would that be necessary? And when the records were provided, they were woefully lacking and shed no light whatsoever on what it is that Catherine McDonald does there, what are her hours, what are her duties, because she didn't have any. She was paid starting within two months of the murder. She was getting consecutive checks, sometimes four at a time, all handwritten by Donna Adelson. And her best friend, Yender Mascaro, said she never worked there. 
She also got a lot of gifts from Charlie Adelson after the murder. She was put on the Adelson payroll, as we talked about, and you saw the list of checks. And she netted a total from them of $17,729.73. She, she, she did pay cash for her breast augmentation, which she says she saved up for, but there's you know, no corresponding withdrawal. She says she held back the cash deposits. But she also deposited about four grand in cash that month, so she had a pretty good month if she saved up that much money and still continued to have the steady deposits that are shown on this exhibit. Uh, states 114, on November 10th of 2015, Charlie Adelson paid $1,620.77 for repairs to her Mazda. The black Lexus, which was formerly owned by Harvey Adelson, and which she told Yendra Mascaro was a gift, and which, according to Mascaro, was in pristine condition, she acquired the title to that on January 23, 2016. All of these things post-murder, and all of them post-relationship with Mr. Adelson. Should be noted that on November 5, 2015, Charlie Adelson tells Catherine McDanawa in a text message that his dad had recently put five grand into the Lexus before he bought it from his dad. On November 6, 2015, Charlie Adelson gives Catherine McDanawa his credit card. On May 20th, 2015, she's asking Charlie Adelson for money when at the time she had $15,000 in her account. Six days later, she deposited $1,400 in cash she has no recollection of ever getting any cash from Mr. Adelson. There was a lot of back and forth between the state and defense about these financial benefits and gifts, but I think the bottom line is clear. She was receiving some very unusual treatment for an ex-girlfriend. There's nothing wrong with giving people gifts or loans or handouts, but when you look at this financial picture in comparison to the homicide date, it's pretty undeniable that she had this huge benefit that coincided dead on with the murder of Mr. Markell. Mr. Rivera said that her cut was $30,000 for her part in this crime, $30,000. If you subtract her identifiable, legitimate income from her cash deposits in 2014, guess what the difference is? $30,000. That, when considered with the Adelson Institute checks and the other gifts she received and all the other evidence in this case, is very compelling evidence. Catherine McBanawa says she earned the money at the club, but you know she wasn't in the club because of Ms. Mascara's testimony. Now, she may have gone back to the club after the murder, but at the time of this spike, she was not in the club. Also of importance, before we leave Ms. Mascaro and go to the wire, the night Dan Markell was shot, Catherine McBanawa asked Yendra Mascaro to watch her kids. This was an unusual request for her to keep the kids overnight. This is the night that McBanawa's phone is consistent <coughs> with meeting Rivera and Garcia at Rivera's residence, the one where Jessica lived, and then leaving them, the phone is off all night, and then the next morning, she's traveling south, talking to Charlie Adelson for 25 minutes, and then her phone is consistent with the money drop, which was that slide I showed you before, all consistent with Mr. Rivera's residence. When she shows up at Ms. Mascara's house to pick her kids up that day, that morning, she tells Ms. Mascara that Charlie Adelson's brother-in-law has been in a car accident. All right, let's talk about the wire. When the undercover hands Donna Adelson an article about her murdered son-in-law, insinuates that she was involved, and then tried to extort $5,000 out of her, does she go straight to the police? This person has information about who it was that killed her son-in-law. This is a cold case. He was executed 
in cold blood in his driveway in Tallahassee, and now this man approaches her and he knows about it? A, that's really scary for her. And B, she's going to solve this murder. But what does she do? Does she report it to law enforcement? Nope. She goes straight to Charlie Adelson, who goes straight to Catherine Magbanawa, who goes straight to Sigfredo Garcia. It's exactly what this undercover operation was designed to ferret out. Where will this information travel if we put it in the hands of Donna Adelson? She calmly folds that piece of paper and puts it in her bag without even looking at it. She goes to pick up her grandsons from school. She returns home and she calls Charlie Adelson. They meet the next day. <clears throat> it's crucial to note that while the first few calls are not in evidence, you don't have the content of the conversations between Charles Adelson and Donna Adelson, the fact about those calls has come in for you to consider, which is that Charlie Adelson, Donna did not say the name Katie to Charlie Adelson before this meeting. We don't know what they said in this meeting. We tried to surveil it, but we couldn't. It's too loud or whatever. We couldn't record it. But the phone calls prior to this meeting do not include any mention of the name Katie or Catherine McBanawa, despite the fact that the undercover did say it. And before this meeting, Charlie Adelson calls Catherine McBanawa. So he was not told the name. Yet, out of all his ex-girlfriends, I think it's 87, he says in one place. That's probably exaggerated, but maybe not. He calls one, one ex-girlfriend, Catherine McBanawa. Then he goes to meet his mother to get the details. And he tells Ms. McBow on that first call, you know, oh, maybe it's not you. I just, you know, they said ex-girlfriend. So I'm calling you. I'll, I'll get back to you if it does involve you. And then he gets back to her. <coughs> because it does involve her. So you've heard these initial calls where they're kind of dancing around the issue. He can't know for sure whether or not she's a part of this this, because this guy is representing himself as some Latin king guy that knows information about the murderer, knows the killer. So is Catherine Magbano involved in the plot to extort his mother? He can't be sure at this point. Neither can be sure that it's not the police. They both know they're under suspicion. So they're just feeling each other out in those first few calls. Ooh. Call F seems to be um, the first one where they kind of drop that. So Charlie's offering to pay for Catherine McBanawa and Sigfredo Garcia to go on a weekend getaway and call F. Call K, which I tried to include. Oh. All right, so forget what I said about call K. The Dolce Vita meeting, you know that we can't hear very much in this, but I want to play it for you so that you can see him looking at the paper. McBanawa cannot recall any of the contents of that conversation other than Mr. Adelson was talking about scenarios. I'm going to tell you something right now and I'm going to make this very clear. I'm going to make something very clear because you're talking belligerent bullshit. I'm going I'm to make something very clear, okay? Me about anything, and now you're gonna come at me? Why? Because you don't know how to apologize because you were wrong. Okay? This is the same thing that happened last time. Listen, I have a more pressing matter 
that I have to attend to. Well, I'm okay? Saying, you know what? I don't feel secure because you take care of everybody else. Where's my security? So when are you going to step up for me? When is no. that going to happen? Because I feel like everybody else gets the, uh, the special attention. And then, Katie, you go figure it out. You go figure it out. You figure out the kids. You figure out life. You figure Katie, out your Katie, partner. Katie, you Katie, Katie, you're out so... Life. Katie, you're doing this again. This is the same shit. I've been here. I've never felt happier. Every we were so happy. We were so... We were so happy. Pool. You have to play pool. You have to believe me. Oh, my God, Katie. All right, all right, man. All right, all right. Then fine. Then, then go. Whatever. Fine, go. If that's what you need to do to make yourself happy, then I'm not going to hold you back. Why haven't you? Why do you have to go through back everything? After everything we went through, why does it have to go back to square one? Do you know how bad I feel? It's like, again, I feel like I'm getting kidding. No, listen, listen, listen. It's always, no. God, I swear to God. It's just like, it's like I should just go some. Because it's like you're basically do that. over. Do you're that. putting me over. You're gonna tell me I'm gonna make a phone call. Are you? I'm not making that fucking phone call. This is a clip from Call K. This is the first call where we hear Sigfredo Garcia, and he is not happy. <clears throat> Maybe because he has learned for the first time that Charlie Adelson is involved in this whole thing. Maybe he's learned that Charlie Adelson was the one that really paid him to do the deal. That's just a theory. But what we know is that Mac Banawal was asked to get to the bottom of this and figure out who was behind it, who it was that approached Charlie Adelson's mother. She assures Charlie Adelson she's going to handle it herself, but what she does is go to Sigfredo Garcia and put the task on him. You call the phone number. You figure out who it is. Fucking do what you want to do. Do it. I'm gonna take care of my fuck. I'm gonna take care of this fucking problem. I'm gonna take care of this fucking problem. And then. What are you gonna take care of? Because you don't discuss anything with me. You're not even listening. Because they let you know the better of the man. No, you're making me. Stop, stop, man. Just stop talking on the phone, man. Bye. Here's a slide of text S, which was introduced into evidence on April 26, 2016. Garcia says to Mag Banawa, whatever is going on with you and your homie, who she admits is Charlie Adelson, is your business. You guys work that shit out. Don't text me. Catherine Mag Banawa admits that Garcia could not stand Charlie Adelson. In call L, Catherine Magvanoa is giving Garcia the undercover's number, and she does it in code. This is a really important piece of evidence. What was her explanation for why she was talking in code? Because my kids were around or my coworkers were around. Well, you're given a phone number. Why does that need to be coded? She's talking about Ethan's clothes cost $65.70. What's that about? That's the last four digits of the undercover number. Of course, he doesn't get it, and she has to repeat it several times, and eventually he does get it. After she says, the amount that I gave you on that piece of paper, I'm not sure if it's $67.50 or $65.70. He goes, got it. I asked Catherine Magdanoa, why would it be necessary? Did she give an explanation for that that was reasonable to y'all? In the next several calls, the three of them Charlie Adelson, Catherine McDowell, and Sigfredo Garcia proceed to have, you know, this ridiculous, what's the number, what's the number, back and forth conversation, trying to get this number straight, and really trying to, all trying to act like they're calling it when they're not calling it. Call Z is the one where Charlie Adelson is indicating to Catherine McDowell that he wants the problem flushed. And that was a joke in the sense that it was potty humor, but... I think it was a reference to what the real problem was that he did in fact want flushed. Then he says, why don't you guys go on vacation, leave the kids at home, have a cocktail and call it a day. He offers to pay for that vacation. Why is Charlie Adelson offering to pay for her and her baby daddy to go on vacation? 
Charlie's trying to get Catherine Magbano to call that number. Magbano is trying to get Garcia to call it. Garcia's lying to Magbano about having called it. Magbano is lying to Charlie about having called it. Charlie is lying to his mother, assuring her that he's got it all figured out and it's no problem. And that, you know, alluding that it's the police, it's not any real threat. And then there's states DD. Catherine Magbano and Charlie Adelson. Um, somebody called my dad's office mm -hmm. and looked in for him, saying okay. that they dropped off some paperwork uh, to them. Mm -hmm. well, there was a phone number on there, and that the person left the message with Erica. How much time do you want to reserve for your rebuttal, Ms. Kevin? I still have 30 minutes remaining, Judge, so whatever's left is left. What's that? I'm told I have about 30 minutes right, remaining, no. so I'm going to keep going, finish what I have planned. I'm calling a timeout for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What happened? Um, somebody called my dad's office mm -hmm. and looking for him, saying okay. that they dropped off some paperwork uh, to them. Mm -hmm. well, there was a phone number on there, and that's the person left the message with Erica. Uh -huh. An office this morning saying that I left some people work with Dr. Adelson last week, and I left the number on there, and he needs to call me at that number. Somebody said fucking pulling your wrong. 305, that's 1567. You have the number. Exactly. That number is obviously, it's like a non-working number. I mean, it's someone who wants to be called back. Let's put it that way. Do you, do you still have the number? Yeah, well, obviously that number, nobody picked me up. Well? That's a not, a not a working number. It's like a Gmail number. Nobody, nobody's pulling the leg. I'm just asking you to find out who the fuck it is. It's like, sure. get that number that's off of your, off of the thing, off of the number, off of the freaking um, caller ID. At the office? Yes, obviously. So this is like a fucking bullshit game. Well, they're not, they're not coming out on foot. They're not writing letters and they're not calling the office because they have nothing better to do. <coughs> well, I don't know what to talk about because it's like not being that number my joke anymore. Because it's not a fucking joke, it's like Katie. Somebody it's not. harassing you guys if somebody's harassing and you join me. And it's like... Okay. No, I'm going to go straight from my fucking cell phone because it's fucking bullshit and fucking somebody's trying to fucking pinpoint some bullshit. Like, it's, it's getting aggravating. Yeah, it is. All I'm saying is find out who the fuck it is and tell them to stop playing their games. You're an idiot. You gave a fucking wrong know, number. Get the fucking number and a fucking call because I'm going to call it. It needs to be nipped in the okay. butt. No, I'm going to handle this shit myself, myself bro. Give a shit about all these bullshit. bullshit. I'm going to handle it my motherfucking self. Well, straight my my fucking number. They fucking if if Erica wants to call back, be like, oh, is this the right number? Okay, I have your fucking whatever fucking shit taken care of. Okay, because this is fucking bullshit. So what I'm saying is, find out who the fuck. That number it doesn't is. fucking work. If you can get a hold, you go to different offices. Call the motherfucking number. See if the fucking number works. Bottom line. I'm trying myself, and that shit does not work. Hey, call them, find out who the fuck it is now. Trust me on this. Fuck find it out is, who bro. the fuck it is. Get the number, listen to me, and get the number. I'm going to call my mom and, and have my mom call the get office. Get the fucking number. Because Which now number? your fucking parents, that number's been called, and I'm not, not a working number. So if I have somebody's playing games, somebody's tapping into some shit, and somebody's just trying to fucking aggravate somebody. Oh. All right, so this is called DD. Couldn't hear it very well. 
but those were some clips from it. And Miss Magdanawa drops the code in this, and she says it. She's like, I'm done with this code crap, and really kind of reveals herself a little bit. And it's after this call that Charlie Adelson finally does actually call the undercover, and you heard the call GG that he had with the undercover. What does Charlie Adelson say when the undercover explains that since his family's problem has been taken care of up north, Charlie Adelson has been taking care of Katie and Tuto, but has done nothing for Tato. Does he say, what family problem up north? What are you talking about? Why did you hand a picture of my murdered brother-in-law to my mother? Or I have no idea what you're talking about. No. He says, all right, let me look into things. Quote, then in HH, Charlie Adelson is reporting back to Magdanawa what his conversation was with the undercover and called GG. Mr. Adelson says that the undercover says Tuto and Tato. He doesn't, but he just says he doesn't know them. Magdanawa knows exactly who Tuto and Tato are, but she doesn't enlighten Mr. Adelson as to who these folks are. On um, JJ, Ms. Magdanawa reports the latest bump, which was the call to the Adelson Institute to Mr. Garcia and says, quote, it's getting too detailed. It's somebody that knows for sure. This call ends with more discussion about what the number is. Garcia wants Magdanawa to text it to him, and she says, no, I don't want to. Why not? If you're just helping out a friend to investigate something you have nothing to do with, why talking code? Why the fear of texting the number? Call PP, Ms. Magbanoa is bragging about the really nasty voicemail that she left on the undercover's uh, voice me message machine when she nor Garcia have left any such voicemail. She's playing both sides, Garcia against Charlie and back and forth, telling them both what they want to hear. In the same call, PP, she's discussing in code the different scenarios that the bump could be. Adelson suggests in code that it's the cops, and Magdanawa says, quote, that's one scenario, but you know, you've got to figure out the other things just in case. It can only be one of the two, apparently. It's somebody that's desperate, not from the inside. What? Quote, that's what I know for a fact. It's not from the inside. It's somebody trying to be greedy. I'm hoping I'm on the right lead, and either way, my friend said that either way, no matter what, he takes total responsibility of whatever just because of the mere fact of my name. That's the wire. I want to talk to you. I know I'm running out of time, but briefly about the law. The crime charged is a first-degree murder because it was premeditated. I don't even really want to talk to you about lesser-included offenses and waste my valuable tiny minutes that are dwindling because this is about the most premeditated murder imaginable. We've got stalking and following and planning and trips and stuff going back a year in time. We talked in jury selection so very, very long ago about how there's no fixed amount of time to generate premeditation. You certainly, certainly have lots of evidence in this case. This murder began with the failed relocation efforts when Charlie Adelson first looked into hiring a hitman. It took root when Catherine Magbanoa enlisted Mr. Garcia, who enlisted Mr. Rivera, to do this killing. That planning went into the killing, was, was extensive, spanning a six-week period, including 2,000-mile trips made in rented vehicles, scouting out the scene, stalking Professor Markell, and all the planning, all the meetings, all the calls came to fruition when Garcia fired those two shots into <coughs> Mr. Markell's vehicle and devastated so many lives in an instant. When you think about how this case was proven, we started at a single point, the crime scene, and we went in two totally different directions. We chased the Prius, and we chased this lead that there was bad blood between the family. And the investigation would have completely stalled if either of those leads had not generated anything. But all those little breadcrumbs led to the same place. The Prius led to Rivera, Rivera led to Garcia, and the bad blood led to the Adelsons, and both trails end at Catherine Magbanoa. When you consider the principal instruction as it relates to these two defendants, I expect you will determine that the instruction does not really apply to Mr. Garcia if you find that he pulled the trigger. 
If you don't think that's been proven, then you should convict him as a principal to Mr. Rivera in that he hired Mr. Rivera to do the crime, rented the first car for the purpose of coming to Tallahassee to kill and or stalk Mr. Markell, and that he made both trips and participated in the stalking of the victim and casing the residence. In reference to Catherine Magbanawa, I do expect that the principal instruction will be crucial to your considerations for her count one murder charge. There are two ways to prove Ms. Magbanawa's guilt for first degree murder under principal theory. One, if she intended that the murder be done and she did some act or said some word that caused or helped another to commit the crime, then she is also guilty of first degree murder. Think about a buyer who hires a contractor to build his home. The contractor, Magbanawa, gets money from the buyer and hires and pays subs to do the work while getting her own cut of the payment. Second way, if she intended the murder to be done and she promised payment in exchange for the murder, bless you, and the crime was committed by another person, she's also guilty of first degree murder. So two ways to prove the, uh, the principal theory. Under the second way to prove the principal theory, think of Ms. Magbanawa as assisting someone who wanted Markel dead and was willing to pay. So she located, hired, and paid the hitman for his the hitman and ultimately his helper for committing the crime. Both ways have been proven, and I would suggest that you should convict her under both theories of principle. Both of these defendants are guilty of everything they're charged with. You have been so very patient throughout this process. And when you get back to the deliberation, I to the deliberation room, I urge you to take your common sense with you, and that's in the jury instructions as well. It all really boils down to that. If the defense or I have offered or asked you to speculate about anything, don't do that. The jury instructions tell you not to do that. Remember that what any of us say is not evidence. They may ask you to discount evidence, but that's up to you to make a decision. They make an argument about discounting it or not. That's ultimately up to you whether or not to accept or discount any piece of evidence or testimony. They may tell you that because all the evidence fits, it's not what it appears. It's something else. They may tell you that the state is blindly or willfully misleading you in some way. Your feelings about the lawyer should not influence your verdict. If you think that, you know, I'm crooked and I've the spoon fed and all that, that's something you can consider as far as how it affected the evidence in the case. But your personal feelings about me and whether I'm as crooked as they say, should not affect your verdict in the case. You should use your common sense in deciding which evidence to believe and which evidence to discard. We are all trusting you to render a wise and legal verdict in this case, and based on all the evidence and testimony that y'all have painfully sat through over this long period of time, that verdict should be a verdict of guilty as charged. Thank you. Let's, let's take as quick a break as we can. Let's keep it as close to five minutes as we can. I know it takes a while. We have one restroom. We'll be in recess.